Welcome to the Broadway.com show, filmed in New York's historic Brill Building. I'm Ryan Lee Gilbert. And I'm Imogen Lloyd Webber. This week we chat with the winners at this year's Broadway.com Audience Choice Awards, sit down with Angels in America's Tony-nominated director and designers, and more. And later we talk to the five Tony-nominated cast members of Broadway's new production of Carousel. But first, let's get started with the news. What's the buzz, Imogen? It's the most wonderful time of year. The Tony Awards are almost upon us. Some of the biggest stars from stage and screen will be appearing at the 72nd annual ceremony, including current Boys in the Band players Zachary Quinto, Matt Bomer, Jim Parsons and Andrew Rannells. Hamilton Tony winner Leslie Odom Jr., two-time Emmy winner and Broadway vet Uzo Aduba, straight white men's Army Hammer, Mary Page Marlowe's Tatiana Maslany and stage alum Claire Danes. Hosted by Sarah Bareilles and Josh Groban, the Tonys will air live on CBS from Radio City Music Hall on June the 10th. NBC has tapped the 1960s musical Hair as its next live TV broadcast. The show, which features music by Galt McDermott and a book and lyrics by Jerome Ragney and James Rado, is set for a spring 2019 airing, produced by Craig Zayden and Neil Marin. Hair, which follows a tribe of young, free-spirited hippies in New York who resist authority and the looming Vietnam War through a be-in and draft card burning, premiered in 1967 at Off-Broadway's Public Theater before a Broadway transfer the following year. The 2009 revival, which starred Gavin Creel, Will Swenson, and Casey Levy, went on to win the Tony Award for Best Revival of a Musical. A long-planned Bye Bye Birdie Live with Jennifer Lopez, initially scheduled for 2017, as well as a live version of A Few Good Men have been delayed. Cast and creative teams for Hair Live will be announced in the coming months. When you think of hair, Ryan, mm -hmm. what comes to mind? Um, nudity, drugs, and free love. Perfect for network TV. Everybody's talking about Jamie, the buzzy new West End musical, is being adapted into a major motion picture via Warp Films. Based on a true story, the Olivier-nominated tuna follows a title character who, after receiving pushback when he announces he will wear a dress to prom, overcomes prejudice, beats the bullies, and steps out of the darkness and into the spotlight. Featuring a book and lyrics by Tom McRae and music by Dan Gillespie Sells, the stage version's director, Jonathan Buttrell, will helm the movie while McRae is penning the script. Filming is expected to commence in spring 2019, with a release date to be announced. Meanwhile, the show has just extended through April 2019 at London's Apollo Theatre. Escape to Margaritaville, the new musical featuring the songs of Jimmy Buffett, has set a date for its last performance on Broadway. The cast will take their final bows at the Marquee Theatre on July 1st. Shortly after closing on the main stem, the cast, including Paul Alexander Nolan, Allison Luff, Lisa Howard, and Eric Peterson, will travel to Washington, D.C. to perform on PBS's A Capital Fourth on July 4th. Directed by Christopher Ashley and featuring a book by Greg Garcia and Michael Malley, an Escape to Margaritaville tour will launch in October 2019 in Providence, Rhode Island. Meanwhile, David Yazbek and Itamar Moses' new musical The Band's Visit will launch its first North American tour also in Providence in June 2019. Directed by David Cromer, The Band's Visit officially opened at Broadway's Ethel Barrymore Theater in November 2017 and was recently nominated for 11 Tony Awards, including Best Musical. Exact dates, casting, and additional cities for both tours will be announced at a later time. Catherine McPhee is taking on a second shift at Waitress. After concluding her current run on June the 17th, McPhee will don Jenna's apron once more from July the 5th through August the 19th. As previously reported, the Smash alum is set to have a leading man switcheroo from June the 5th, when Eric Bergen replaces Drew Galing as Dr. Pometer. Other company members currently cooking up a storm at the Brooks Axon Theatre include Caitlin Houlihan as Dawn, Natasha Yvette Williams as Becky, Steve Vinovich as Joe, Ben Elledge as Cal, Ben Thompson as Earl, and Christopher Fitzgerald as Ogie. Do you think Catherine McPhee was inspired to stay in the role because she won the Broadway.com Audience Choice Award for Favorite Replacement? Sure, and she's a smash. Ah, I see what you did there. Yes, everyone did. Donna Murphy will once again star as Dolly Gallagher Levi at select performances of Hello Dolly. During Bette Midler's upcoming return to the Tony winning revival, Murphy will take the Schubert Theater stage at certain performances. Midler steps back into the production on July 17th, replacing her replacement, Bernadette Peters. She'll play a six week engagement before Hello Dolly ends its run on August 25th. 
Parks and Recreation actor Paul Schneider has completed the cast of young Jean Lee's Straight White Men on Broadway. Schneider joins the previously announced Josh Charles, Army Hammer, Tom Skerritt, and more in the play, which follows a father and his three adult sons as they ring in Christmas by contemplating the value of straight white men in a society driven by conversations of identity and privilege. Directed by Anna D. Shapiro, Straight White Men will begin performances at the Helen Hayes Theater on June 29th. And Jason Tam will appear in the off-Broadway premiere of Be More Chill, taking on the role of the Squip. As previously reported, the Coming of Age musical, which features a score by Joe Iconis, will begin performances July 26 at the Pershing Square Signature Center. When we come back, we sit down with My Fair Lady's lovely design team, get a sneak preview at the new musical Halftime, and more. This week on Broadway.com, SpongeBob SquarePants Tony nominee Ethan Slater talks about making the role his own on Show People. The boys in the band's Charlie Carver turns on the charm and more. It's Broadway's most nominated new musical with 12 Tony nominations, including Best Actor, Best Director, Best Choreography, Best Score, and Best Musical of the Year. SpongeBob SquarePants, the Broadway musical. Get your tickets now. Hi, I'm Ethan Slater, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Welcome back. Since the year 2000, Broadway.com has asked our readers to pick their favorites of the season in our annual Broadway.com Audience Choice Awards. This year, Mean Girls, SpongeBob SquarePants, Once on This Island, and Angels in America came out on top. We hit the red carpet at a private reception for the winners and chatted with them about why this award given by the fans is truly special. It is exhilarating to be in a room filled with people who are fans of theater and also who were voted on by fans of theater. Uh, it's pretty special. It makes you realize how incredible this community is. I come into the room and I, I see collaborators that I know and collaborators that I respect and love. So I feel like um, you know it just brings people together in another way and then we get to celebrate each other's work. When it comes to award season, it's, it's the people in the business, it's the people who have been doing this for years. So to have an event, to have an award where it's, it's about the fans and the people who come and see the show, it's really cool. Every day, every night, every performance, you're trying to deliver the play and make it a worthwhile experience for you know this this audience that's you know it's it's a big thing to go to a Broadway play and they're they're discerning. It's just really thrilling to know that people actually really enjoyed it and and um, and remembered it. I don't know if I'm going to get to experience this again. Where before we've even set foot on stage, people are cheering and they're excited to see what's going to happen. And then to know that what we've done after that, they've enjoyed and that they voted and are supportive of the show. That's really wonderful. It just feels really nice for people who are taking the time out of their lives and taking money out of their own pockets to come see the show and supporting you and so I'm honored to be here. Here's what the stars had to say directly to their fans. Oh my god! Oh my acceptance speech. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to everyone who voted for this. It's so cool. It makes me so happy. Um, thank you. Thank you so much fans and do not throw away your shot and we love you from the ham fam. Thank you so much. Uh, we will treasure this and um, uh, you know it's a it's a it's a glorious honor for us a uh, uh, cursed child it really brings us so much joy to know that you like the show and that you like the songs and we, uh, thank you you are the best thank you to everybody who voted for female breakthrough artists I love you all thanks for coming to see the show you guys rock you are so gruel stay gruel Mwah. there are too many people to thank because it takes a village to make a show and it takes a village to make a role so thank you to everyone hey we love you and thank you, and how cool is this? And come see us do the show and act like idiots. Broadway.com, friends, fans, theater goers, we love you, keep coming to the theater. We asked this year's winners what they're going to do with their new trophies. I'm going to treasure it in my house. <laughs> you know, I'm actually moving very soon, and so I'm picking out uh, like shelves that it might go on. I think it would look nice on something with sort of like a blonde finish or a beige finish, so. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be taking this to Ikea next weekend to see what it looks best on. I'm going to uh, uh, snuggle this award right next to my other two awards that I got a couple years ago for Hamilton, so thank you, audience, for choosing me again. Well, Tina Fey puts her award on, the, the, on her toilet. Well, one of her awards, she has many. So maybe I'll do that too. <laughs> I think Jeff put one in there as a joke, thank and it's kind of stayed it, when the cast funny. was coming over. But I wouldn't say what kind, because then no, that would be... But it's a heavy one. And it works well in the bathroom, and it's, and, it and you have paper. several of them. Well, <laughs> so, and it's, but it's not an Emmy, so 
And Taylor Lauderman will never be invited back to our home again. <laughs> so, so everybody. I'm going to put them in a very special place. I, they go on a special shelf so yeah, that I, I can think... look at them and be reminded that art isn't about myself. It's about putting something out for people to identify with and hopefully that helps them through their life. The sweeping revival of My Fair Lady reunites the Tony-winning creative team with director Bartlett Cher, costume designer Katherine Zuber, and set designer Michael Jurgen. The trio has earned awards and acclaim for their past collaborations, including The King and I, Fiddler on the Roof, The Bridges of Madison County, South Pacific, and more. We spoke with this dream team about the Lincoln Center Theater revival of My Fair Lady and why they work so well together. Our collaboration, the collaboration with Bart Scher and Catherine Zuber and Don Holder has been a dream come true and it, it didn't come easy. I mean, we, we sort of all started off on the, the same show. So when we all kind of got together, it just, I don't know, it just sort of clicked. There's certain trust builds up, a certain um, shorthand and a certain uh, understanding of um, everyone's um, aesthetics, uh, intelligence and style of telling a story. I think the great thing about them is that among them, I ha they have an extraordinary depth of experience and a really rich knowledge for how to approach these musicals because they've worked for so long in so many areas and with so many great other collaborators than myself. One of the most admirable things about Bart is he really, he's very loyal and he really does build, each show kind of builds on the next one. Some of the things that you discovered on one show you can carry over into the next one. You know, they're, they're largely, you know, got about a hundred years worth of experience on them, so they're pretty great. Although this is the fifth time My Fair Lady has been on Broadway, the beloved classic still presents challenges to be solved by the design team. My Fair Lady turned out to be one of the most difficult tasks we ever uh, took on. Um, we would quietly call it the, the ring cycle of musicals, meaning it was like, like trying to do Wagner or something. It was really big. One of the reasons it's so difficult is it's very, very demanding in terms of location. We wanted the study to be as real as possible, and we wanted one of the issues with the study in My Fair Lady is that so much of the play happens there. And in the original set, it was just one space. We came up with a turntable idea in a multifaceted sort of world which we could turn and live in and out of and move and really get a sense of transformation. Then you've got the Ascot, which is all of Kathy's fantastic costumes, and we knew that that really had to be kind of surreal, so we just put it against a glowing white background with this ethereal kind of a canopy that, that drapes over it. I felt that if the men and the women were of the same palette, it would give the illusion of um, a larger population where it wasn't divided between men and women. By making it all in mauves and grays, stone colors and off-whites, it kind of um, kind of pulled everybody together. And then out of that, by having Eliza with black and white, you know, we could keep our eye on our leading lady and have, you know, know where to look within those scenes. With its themes of transformation and independence, My Fair Lady is a story for all time, and this year's stunning revival delivers in every way. My Fair Lady is one of the great shows of all time. It happens to be the first musical that I ever saw in my life when I was a kid in Dallas, Texas. And it's a great story, a fantastic story that's even more relevant now than when it was first done. We all work so hard on everything we do and when it's a success and the audience appreciates what all the collaborators have done, when, when all of that comes together and we have that positive feedback, uh, it's just great. There's nothing like it. My Fair Lady plays at the Vivian Beaumont Theatre. The new musical Halftime is based on the true story of 10 senior citizens who auditioned to dance at halftime for a major basketball team. Directed by Jerry Mitchell and featuring a bevy of familiar names including Lilius White, Georgia Engel, Donna McKechnie, and Andre DeShields, this feel-good show is playing New Jersey's Paper Mill Playhouse. See the seniors bust a move in rehearsal. It's based on a documentary called Gotta Dance, and uh, it's about this uh, group of senior dancers who perform at halftime at a basketball game, but they perform hip-hop. What I love about the show is what hip-hop means, how it started, how it was a, a form of expression, a, a statement, 
of, of saying I'm here and I stand up and I, I should be counted and I'm important. It's a wonderful platform for all of us elders who are out there who still have some fire and some life in us and we want to show it off. Parents are being their grandparents and their grandkids and it brings everybody together and it, it makes the generation gap disappear. It teaches us not to give up just because things are hard and not and to continue to challenge ourselves and follow our dreams. And I think that that's a really important message and something that anybody can really relate to. Learning hip hop choreography is just as much of an adjustment for the performers of halftime as it is for the characters they portray. Mitchell and the cast spoke about taking on the fancy footwork. They really are learning hip hop. Nick Kenkel is teaching them all of the, the authentic hip hop stuff and they've really, really, they've met the challenge. The beauty of this show is when we came together, it was very much like the premise, the conceit of the show. We didn't know one another, and that's one of the exciting elements of the show. You are actually experiencing us bonding for the first time. A few aches and pains attached, I will not lie about that. All of us have been doing lots of Epsom salts baths and ice on the knees, but it's, it's worth it. Catch Halftime at the Paper Mill Playhouse through July 1st. The Tony-nominated revival of Angels in America offers up a fantastical world that switches location, time period, and mood swiftly. We spoke with director Marianne Elliott and her set designers Ian McNeil and Edward Pierce about creating the space for this theatrical masterpiece to focus on the humanity of its epic storytelling. When Ian McNeil and I started designing it, we wanted a whole concept for the whole of the two plays. Start somewhere that you think is recognisable, you know, polished, but maybe sort of kind of theatre that you've seen before, and then evolve into something which is more imaginary, more surprising, more hallucinatory. With this kind of uh, progression from one thing to something else, we also felt like it should become more and more obvious in a way that you are in a theatre. By the end of the story, we are in the empty theatre space. That is the penultimate moment of, of the design, really. It's showing how spare we can be and what very little you need to, to tell the story. And then as you back away from that, it is all a reaction to the theatre space and the experience that that audience has in that moment. When there's an empty stage, there's an awful lot of craft on our parts to make the human figure strong in what seems to be a place with nothing in it. It looks like there's nothing there, but where your eye lands is actually quite controlled. You really need to guide the eye so that the human figure is not stranded. With its slick, neon-edged design that even extends to the Angels in America poster, the creative team further explores the themes of Tony Kushner's epic drama. The neon came from the idea of heaven. Heaven, according to the angels, or the angel of America, is a place which is falling apart, is disheveled, has been abandoned by God. There's a moment in heaven where it talks about the generator failing. So we felt like that was a kind of pulsing electricity thing. And we felt that if Angels in, in America was sort of set around now-ish, I mean, I know it's 1985, but we wanted to try and make it feel more now as well. Uh, it felt like the idea of electric light, electric light fizzing, electric light going out, every scene is framed somewhat by a neon frame. There's 67 or so scene changes between the two plays and we span from Central Park to apartments on the Lower East Side, offices, hallucinogenic visions of Antarctica. It spans the end result of having sat in your theater seat for nearly eight hours experiencing this wonderful story and all of these characters and all of these places that we've taken you is that by the end, as much as you might have been enamored with any individual moment, you realize that there was an absolute slaughter amount of stuff that is like, where has it all gone? And that also allows you to breathe when you leave that all of this journey it also is as empty as it was full. Catch both parts of Angels in America at the Neil Simon Theatre.
When we return, we sit down with Carousel Tony nominees Jesse Mueller, Joshua Henry, Lindsay Mendez, Alexander Gemignani, and Renee Fleming. Don't waste another minute. Critics are calling it Paradise on Broadway. And Entertainment Weekly says Escape to Margaritaville will knock your flip-flops off. Now I think about the good times down in the Caribbean sunshine. It will transport you on a high from start to finish. So don't miss Broadway's Good Time Musical. Welcome to Margaritaville. Don't let the party start without you. Get your tickets today. The new Broadway staging of Roger and Hammerstein's Carousel is the most honored musical revival at this year's Tony Awards, earning 11 nominations in total. Among that tally are five nods for the show's stars, Jesse Mueller and Joshua Henry as ill-fated lovers Julie and Billy, Lindsay Mendez and Alexander Gemignani as sardine sweethearts Carrie and Enoch, and opera icon Renee Fleming as Nettie Fowler, who delivers the stirring You'll Never Walk Alone. We recently gathered the talented fivesome for a photo shoot and also sat them down for a quick chat about the everlasting power of this 73-year-old classic. We are sitting with, oh my God, five Tony nominees in mm. one show. Mm. That's crazy. Mm. That doesn't happen all On the time. On two couches. So first of all, congratulations. That's, that's nuts. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And some first timers. This couch. Here. The red <laughs> couch. <laughs> oh, we'll tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. I love this show. This is my favorite classic musical. I always say this. Carousel is number one for me. Is being great in a great musical sort of easier? When it's classic and you know it works, I think it lends itself to the personalities that can come and sort of reinterpret it like a great Shakespeare or something like that. So, And there's so much emotion built into the music right away and people know a lot of the music so their expectation is already high. Did you know the music? All of it. Yeah. All of it. I did not know the show. I'd never seen it. Did you guys know it all? I knew most of it, yeah. But I wasn't that familiar with the script. So to read it and then to f see how all of this music that we all know so well fits into telling this incredible story, it was, it was really cool for us to kind of like dive into it again, I think. Mm -hmm. And fun to do something like this with people like this because it, to me, it always defines my Julie is because of his Billy and her Carrie. Right. When you're in a room with the best of the best, it ups your game and it and everybody just brings so much to it. I think it actually says a lot that I've seen you play Carrie at Lincoln Center. But uh, now I can't imagine it any other way. Like <laughs> Lindsay's Carrie to me. I just really, I, re I really mean that though. I wouldn't be able to kind of redefine it in my brain anymore. It's just. It's always you, Lindsay. I got in your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, Lindsay. I, I think it says a lot about the material that you actually. It's it's not so. You know, I'm a Julie, I'm a Carrie. It feels like you're able to lend yourself to these roles in, in a great way. With, with all just like great respect to all of the productions of all the classic shows that have come before us, the trope of sort of the like kind of person who plays each role, I think, I don't think Jack and Justin were interested in that so much. I think they were interested in community Mm -hmm. and how do these people function together in a community mm -hmm. and how do they not? Who are, who are the people who don't function within the community or, or work their way in or work their way out? And I think if you take that lens on Carousel, you get this very sort of like deep tapestry of rich colors that these people live their lives with. And you know, the resulting thing is like we all feel on stage there's this thing of like, I can't really imagine it another way, as mm -hmm. Jesse was saying, because it's so, feels ingrained, you know? She's come to be sheltered and fed and dressed in the best that money can buy. I never knew how to get money, but I'll try by God, I'll try. And go out and make it, or steal it, or take it. Josh, what is it like to sing a soliloquy every night? It's incredible. I love a song like that, or If I Loved You, which was the first song in musical theater that I ever learned. If I Loved You. If I Loved You? If Did I you sing you. both parts? I sang, <laughs> I didn't even know there was another part. Like, I sang the selection, which was just <laughs> like, like chorus. Yeah, yes. like, yeah. I Loved You. Like you're saying, the material is so rich that it, it challenges you every night. For me, it just feels like you can't think about it. You know, that the intro starts and it's like skydiving. You're like, what are you, you Here can't just go. reach up to the plane again. You're already falling. Like, you <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. When Jack O'Brien, great director, has directed so many amazing uh, plays and musicals and classics and new works over the years, what was the mission when you started? When I first talked to him, he really wanted to 
lean into the spiritual aspect of this piece. So some um, conversation I had with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, really the theme of redemption and what that means. And asking the questions about, do we get second chances? What does it mean to be loved? Like the adventure of that, the innocence of that, the purity of that, what that can be. He just kept saying over and over, he's like, let's ask the questions. Let's keep asking the questions. Because people know this well, let's not rely on that. Let's make sure we get to, at every point, if we have a question, let's ask the question. Mm -hmm. Let's not just do it the way it's always been done because that's how it's been done. To have a director that, that lets you do that and not make, doesn't make you feel in the room that like you're wasting time. <laughs> You know what I mean? But, yeah. but, but gives right. permission for that kind of work. And it I built think. so much trust between us. I feel like there, wasn't, there just isn't a moment that we haven't all discussed together. And so we can all serve the piece rather than serving ourselves. I think, I think that unlocks a real non-precious way to view something that you could potentially try to hold with kid gloves and miss the sort of like deeper heart of a thing. And so ironically, by not being precious with it and being able to like blow the dust aside and ask all the questions you want to ask, you honor it in a much for me, like a much truer way. It's yeah. authentic that yeah. way. And yeah. it can handle yeah. it, the piece can handle it. It's like the more yeah. we dug into it, the more we opened it up, I feel like the more we found, it's, it's not like you open it up and there's just not the depth to be found, it's, it's there. Were there any specific moments that were challenging for any of you or exciting to work on in the rehearsal room? I'll never forget the first time we started going into the I bench scene. I was so nervous. I, didn't I was like, let's not work on it. I didn't know. <laughs> in fact, we, can, we got time. I was like, we got time, right? We can just crack that one open like a week. Everybody loves a song. There will be a bench. The twists and turns <laughs> in, that, in that piece are, are so intricate and trying to find them truthfully. Truthfully, yeah. You know, I remember we got into the room and we were sort of sitting this close to each other oh, I know. and we were doing the scene just like this and, and it felt great and then we had to sing and, and there was this big divide between the performance volume and the intimacy of the scene right. yeah. and it took so long to find what that was and to, for that to feel. Yeah, the balance of that. I yeah. Think. So. We uh, blocked that how many times? I, again, I, don't, I don't, know. don't know. We're on like version 12.5. Yeah. You know what else was hard was the stuff with the three women with yep. you. Yes, that's ca true. Calling when we would hold Julie to task about her relationship with Billy. Yeah. Both those moments between the three of us, we yeah. worked so much. Remember that scene? That's true. Yep. And yeah, then also what's the use of one Right. And like the it's this it's we have an obligation in I think 2018 to like make sure we're saying, you know, the the right thing with holding Julie up and also, you know, calling her out, I think, and it took us till probably the last preview to figure some of that stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, making sure the women, I think, were authentic. Yes, and, and strong. And, and strong mm -hmm. and complex. And yeah. I was so stunned in the preview process, completely stunned. I just assumed a classical piece like this had been around for 75 years. What are you going to do? You're just going to do it as well as you can. No, no, no. <laughs> things were added and cut and added again and moved around and oh, yeah. things were reblocked re five times. It was extraordinary. And in the end, People who came, who I know, who came early on in the previews, who then saw it later, just said they could not believe the difference and how much more exciting it was. I first was introduced to the power of this show many years ago, and, and I love any opportunity to see a new version of it and a new cast do it. And, and it's sort of undeniable. What is it like for you on stage to be in something that you know has that? Why, why do you love it, Paul? I'm curious. Yeah, what it, do you it, think it, just it is? So, it moves me it's so, so tremendously. I mean. Because it's of its sort of epic nature or the depth of it or a combination? Like, what do you think it is? I'm just a moderator here. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, we're literally interested. I guess the reason I'm asking that question, to me, part of the beauty is that I can't tell you why. I can't define it. It is, mm. bigger than, it is bigger than one person. It's even bigger than a group. I think it's about tapping into something very deep and very human yeah. and very innate and very complex mm -hmm. <laughs> about what it's like to spend your time on this planet. And thinking about the people who leave you who are still looking out for you, yeah. that we all hope for that, I think. The I idea do. that you're not alone. And, yeah. and so getting to see a piece about that, and there, there's that, and then there's the score, which is like, yeah. when that prologue starts, it's like, it's overwhelming, the sound of what they made. And I just think all of it together makes, it's just, ma it's magic. One more thing, is there any other show you can all imagine doing together? Yes, we've uh, already talked, we've about talked about it. it. We talked about Guys and Dolls. Yes. We talked about Guys and Dolls. What was the other one we were talking about the other day? Yes. Uh, oh, Calcutta.
Nope. <laughs> she, she wasn't it. Well, you're going to be doing uh, Carousel for a while, so I'm thrilled. And it's at the Imperial Theater, and everyone needs to go see it. And thank you all for being thank here. You. Thank, you, Paul. Thanks. Paul. thanks, Paul. When we come back, we hit the rehearsal room for a sneak peek at the Paper Mill Playhouse production of Halftime. It's Broadway's most nominated new musical, with 12 Tony nominations, including Best Actor, Best Director, Best Choreography, Best Score, and Best Musical of the Year. SpongeBob SquarePants, the Broadway musical. Get your tickets now. Hey, it's Adina Menzel here, and you're watching the Broadway.com show. Thank you for watching the Broadway.com show. We leave you with senior citizens doing hip-hop moves in half time. See you next week.